Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Greg Foster, and I'm excited to once again be moderating a panel, although this is more of a discussion uh, between myself and Mark Weinstock, who is the president of global marketing and distribution for Paramount Pictures, having an incredible year, uh, someone I've worked with and, and respect immensely. Um, and so we're just going to kind of have a chat about the theatrical business, how the theatrical business exists within the context of the streaming business and vice versa and some of the incredible things that have happened so far this year with hopefully more to come for mark and and paramount so mark good morning good to see you good morning good morning okay um all right so let's just get going so first of all congratulations on the amazing year uh between sonic and lost city and obviously maverick and this amazing weekend that you just had on smile which continued every every uh you know, starting on Thursday night, it was a little bit better than people thought. And Friday was a little bit better. And Saturday was a little bit better. And Sunday was a little bit better. So congratulations on that. You are the story so far this year for getting people back into the movies and, and particularly movie goers. We sometimes in L.A. like to talk about how important it is for those of us that make our living on it. But we only make our living on it based on people around the world who actually go. So let's talk just on a very high level about the year that you've had and why you think it's happened and and what you can continue to do to make it happen in 2023. Of course, um, it has been an incredible year. Thank you for all that. Um, you know, we, it's interesting, the year started, we were a little nervous with Scream um, because another variant had hit uh, in December. And we looked at the data and said, you know what? We think that that audience is specifically the 18 to 34 year old audience was ready to go back to movies. And we went with it, we had the confidence and we released in January, huge number, it was, felt great, which gave us the confidence to keep going. The Jackass the next month, um, same audience structure, 18 to 34. Then, you know, we go into March and we have Lost City, which is, you know, fantastic romantic comedy that uh, that genre had not been doing really well lately at the box office. And based on our research, older women were not returning to the theater like we had hoped. Um, but we felt really strong about it. We had actually moved it up. We were moving, we were, we were later in the year, but we moved it up to March, seeing a hole in the marketplace. Um, and I know the exhibition community was very, very uh, happy for us to move up. And uh, I thought the team came with a great campaign. We had an amazing cast doing uh, a lot of publicity for us. And uh, we did really, really well with that. Once that happened, uh, other movies, other studios were looking at the family business and they were starting, some were putting them on streamers, some were getting a little nervous. Um, it was the one audience that we, no one was sure was gonna come right back, the family audience. And we had a winner in Sonic, a fantastic movie, a great franchise. And, you know, we've had, we had a lot of conversations, do we move it, do we push it? And we said, you know what, we feel good. We looked at the data again, gave us comfort and uh, we, we pushed the button. And it was huge. And we opened a, you know, over $70 million on a non-holiday regular weekend in April, which was just an amazing result for us. The movie did over 400 uh, globally. So that felt good. And then uh, came Top Gun, which, uh, you know, Greg, you and I have had many conversations about. Um, a movie that we had moved five times uh, until we landed on this release date. And uh, you, you know what happened with that. Uh, largest movie in Paramount history and Tom Cruise's biggest movie. Uh, just a fantastic result. And then the uh, latest one, Smile, is, you know, it's great. I, I love a good horror film. And uh, first time director, made a great movie. Um, Brian uh, gave the go ahead. My boss, Brian Robbins, said, like, you know what? This, let's go theatrical. Let's do it. And uh, it was great. I opened number one. And we're enjoying a very good uh, drop this, this weekend, too. So it's great. Well, we, we've got to really focus for a second on Maverick because Maverick is. First of all, it's an amazing movie. Um, you mentioned we've talked about it for a long time. Maverick was actually a movie, I haven't been at IMAX in almost four years, and Maverick was a movie that I was working on at IMAX. So it shows how long it's yeah. been to get to where it is. Um, it's obviously a, a fantastic film, incredibly crafted by Tom, by Joe Kaczynski, amazing director, McHugh, Jerry Bruckheimer, so many others, and, and your team. Take a moment to tell us how Maverick in the world that we live in today, where it's just kind of instantaneous come and go, right? You have a movie, it opens up in 
4,000 screens domestically, which is really like 10 or 11,000 or 12,000 auditoriums on a big title. You've got a multiple of that internationally. These things play, you can see it at seven o'clock, 715, 745, eight o'clock, right? There's six, seven, eight shows in each complex, especially on the opening weekend. So these movies are fast burns, even great ones, they're fast burns. Yet Maverick was the number one movie on Memorial Day weekend, the number one movie on Labor Day. It's now theatrically knocking on the door of 1.5 million globally. We're still, consumer behavior has changed. It would be dishonest to say that it hasn't, even for those of us that love the theatrical business as much as we do. Um, it's almost a half a billion dollars more than the second place film. What happened? Fire away. How, how, what yeah, happened? Yeah. I mean, the, the first time we saw this movie at the first screening, left that theater and said, that is a perfect movie. A perfect movie. I worked on almost 400 movies in my in my life and it's a perfect movie there's not it is absolutely 100 percent like i can find no fault in it it is it's it's literally an amazing amazing accomplishment and if you look at like tom's track record his movies have great multiples they just always have mission all of his movies if you look up and down you know what he's done they really have great multiples so you take that you take a perfect movie you take an audience that wanted this movie. I think, you know, we've been through a lot um, with COVID and, and everything that's been happening in, in our in our lives. And nobody that I know walks out of that movie in, in, a, in a worse mood. You, you leave that theater like, wow, that was amazing. I want to see it again. That's sure. people's first reaction. Like, I can't wait to see it again. And so we were sitting on this movie for years because waiting for that perfect time to unleash it. And that was difficult. That was really hard. We knew we had this perfect gem waiting to go. So that was the tricky part for us because we were so anxious and, you know, we were so excited to finally put it out in May. Um, you know, I think we had a great campaign. We really broke through in the zeitgeist, but when you have a movie this strong, a big part of our campaign was just screening it to as many people as possible. You know, we started at, at CinemaCon. Uh, that was the first, you know, public unveiling of the movie. Uh, no, no better place than to show a couple of thousand exhibitors all at the same time. And it was rapturous. They were just, it was right then and there. You're like, oh my God, this is great. And, you know, a couple of days later, went to San Diego, went on the aircraft carrier, had a fantastic premiere. And once again, another 1,200, 1,500 people saw the movie and same reaction. It was like, okay, this is great. This is fantastic. And then we're like, all right, now we're going to go overseas. Let's see how we do there. We go to Cannes. And, you know, can be a, Cannes can be tricky for some movies. Um, not not a home run slam dunk easy. Uh, yeah, and Top Gun, play. you wouldn't say in, in the sort of smarty pants world of can would be the obvious choice. Yep, and you're sitting in that screening in can, and there's a moment in the movie where you've seen it work in every screening up to that point, and you're waiting, and it worked there, and I was like, okay, this this we're we're there. This is this is global. This can be amazing. And then the final, I don't want to say test because we believed in the movie to every every degree, was you know the royal premiere in London. Because once again, you just never know. Like this is a there was, was a, cre a an amazing audience in that theater, um, sitting there with the the royal family, and it played huge, huge. And we just knew we were like this is gold. And so I'm not going to say our job was easy but it's a lot easier when you have a perfect film. Right. And I think that's a testament to why it worked throughout the summer. When, you know, when movies come out and you hear like, yeah, that movie's good, but have you seen Top Gun yet? And you're like, all right, all right, I'll go see it. I'll go see it. That was kind of the conversation that happened throughout yeah. summer. Um, yeah, I, I have some more questions about that. But one of the things I want to add is that there was also a, a territory that's a significant territory conspicuously missing from the release. Imagine what the release would have been if it had if it had actually been in China, which is you know loves Tom Cruise, he's always been incredible there, yep. and it through no fault of anyone's, at least anyone on on at Paramount or, or the Top Gun team, it, it it wasn't released there. So uh, that to me makes it even more remarkable because I think there's a fair shot that it would have gotten near two billion dollars if, if that had been a part of it or at least close to it. Yeah. Um, for sure. You moved the release date a handful of times. I know that COVID had a lot to do with that. M many felt. Because um, I got some of the calls uh, that you made a mistake moving it out of November of 2021. And yet you and Chris Aronson and, and Brian, who you mentioned, and, and Mark Vianne 
said, no, we're going to move it out and, and we're going to move it to this date in, in May, um, which was just two weeks before Jurassic. So you obviously were incredibly confident, but it was also a, uh, a bold move. Um, why not November? And which, again, you completely, you guys all made the right decision. But why not November when I know you were getting a lot of pressure and instead May? Six for months sure. later, when everyone was dying for movies. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, obviously, COVID was a factor. Um, you know, another variant had come in. And, you know, you, you look at all the data and when a certain portion of the audience, and I believe at that time, I, I want to recollect that we were only in like 68% positive, you know, the, the energy measure that we look at where people's movie going comfort is. And so when you have a third of the audience saying, oh, I'm not so sure I'm ready to go back to theaters, that really makes you question. But the, the real answer I have to say is the DNA of this movie was always a summer movie. It That's really true. was. That was our initial date. And you know, we were very sad to leave our initial date uh, when we were opening um, in end of June, right up into the July 4th holiday. And so when we had moved a couple of times, November would have been great, but like we always wanted it. We knew it would play all summer. We really did. It feels like a summer movie. The beach scenes, it was just made for that. And so with the data we looked at and just knowing that we could really be successful in the summer, we, we, we wanted to grab okay. it. So um, one more Maverick question, maybe two. Um, Tom Cruise, along with, I think, Chris Nolan, um, are the best at sort of boldly showing uh, uh, proudly showing their love for the theatrical experience. What role did Tom play in this? I know he's Tom Cruise. He's the world's biggest movie star. But I know he's also involved in absolutely everything that happens on, on this movie. Um, that's I've worked with him so many times. He's one of the, my favorite people that I've ever worked with by far um, because he cares so much. What specifically did he do to make this movie accessible to everyone? I'm leading the witness a little bit because I think his his social media kind of, uh, you know, clips that went out there showing him in a movie theater, not seeing Top Gun, seeing something else and, yeah. and kind of saying, I'm here, I'm enjoying this. This is how I like coming to the, this is what I like doing, helped make that 68% a little bit higher. Um, but what how did how did he take charge of this and just turn it into what it became i mean he he's a force like he is absolutely amazing um this is my first film working with him and he's he's literally the smartest person in the room and seeing what he does by going to every territory that we asked him to do like he he's amazing and he shakes everyone's hands he is so in it and you know to do the video that he did in front of the movie which we loved that was, you know, we got so many calls and emails about how amazing that was and how personal it was. And it's not a show like this. He's been this movie for 36 years. He's been, you know, waiting to do this film and he had to wait for like the perfect everything. And so another reason why we waited, we waited for the perfect time. But he, he's such a force to be around in terms of like, you know, everything that he did, he did it to the best that it could be done. Like there's just there's no shortcuts. Like it's a hundred percent the best possible thing. And it's like every, every tour, every trailer, everything. It's like, if he loved it, we loved it. We're, we're good. Like, you know, he's got such a high, um, high bar for everything, which I love because we all do. We all want to be the best at what we do. And it's like, he is. So, you know, we just cool. try to keep up with him. So one of the things that's going on in the theatrical business that is, is helping kind of put your best foot forward is everything regarding premium. And, you know, I'm obviously biased about it because of my uh, many years at IMAX. But um, by the way, I think this was one of the movies, um, maybe the top two or three that I've heard. And again, I mentioned Chris earlier, you got to see Maverick in IMAX. I, I think probably the, the camera program had a lot to do with that. But I also think it's just the place to see it as are. I know there are other ones. There's Dolby and there's Screen X and there's XD, et cetera. How, yeah. how much did you guys lean on that and how much of an impact did it have, do you think, on sustaining it over time? Because if you saw it once, maybe in a regular theater, you then had to go see it in an IMAX theater or vice versa. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, it was a big part of our campaign. We, we had um, a quote early, right after we, we just started screening it. And 
it was literally see it in the biggest theater possible. And that was sort of our mantra. That was our big uh, campaign hook in terms of if you're going to see this movie, you got to go to the biggest theater possible. And it is an experience. Like I, I think I've seen the film 12 or 13 times in a theater mm-hmm. and it's, it's amazing. I mean, when you do see it in the biggest screen and that sound and it's just sort of, you know, roars, you're just, you, it's incredible. So that was a huge part of, you know, what we did. We made sure that whenever we screened the movie, whether it was for press or just our early word of mouth screenings or creators or influencers, always in a, in a big format theater. And you could see in the grosses. I mean, it was a huge part of uh, where our grosses. I think, I think the stat is 3% of our theaters were a uh, large format and it was 20% of our gross. Yeah, and again, it's, I think it's pr- particularly amazing because Jurassic came out two weeks later. But you guys, you know, you were kind of the, the in a way, the the turtle, not the rabbit. You you opened up really well, then yep. you kind of dipped for a little bit when Jurassic was there, but then you came back to being number one. Then something else happened, another movie, and you dipped a little bit, and then you came back as being number one. So it's amazing. All right, so we've got to get streaming in here and how these these things coexist. So I'm going to give you some some facts and would love your kind of feedback on it. So there's clearly evidence that theatrical and streaming can coexist. We know that about 60% of consumers are more likely to stream a movie when they knew it had already been released in theaters. That's kind of gives it the, 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 you know, the good housekeeping seal of approval. We know that 60% of consumers who visited a theater more than eight times a year also stream eight or more hours per week and are the streaming business's most loyal customers. And we know that about 40% of of moviegoers agree that seeing a movie advertised for a theatrical release increased their desire to also see it at home. So they can coexist, yet there is no question that consumer behavior has changed, particularly with streaming, having more of a presence with dramedies and comedies, dramas and comedies and, and Hollywood big blockbuster titles that are action packed or IP based having a little bit of a better time in the theatrical market. How what is the right pacing, the right sequencing? Um, how uh, how much does streaming affect the decision to release a movie and when to release a movie? And how do you, as a company that has Paramount Plus plus obviously Paramount Pictures, which is you know just completely killing it right now, how do you guys do that? Uh, that dance to make sure that you satisfy both audiences. Yep, for sure. Um, I mean, every movie has its own sort of pace, but we do like the 45 day window. We do think that's most effective for most of our movies, not every movie. Um, it's you get a big theatrical wow, a pop. Um, you know, for for our campaigns, we really want to enter into the zeitgeist and sort of be part of the culture. And when we do that. 45 days later, when it appears on the service, it does very well. So we kind of get bites of both both apples because the box office, it literally drives the streaming. People are so like, oh, I, I, they'll, they'll see it again at home. So it's not exclusive like, oh, I'll wait. I don't think people waited 45 days. I, I actually think it's the perfect amount. They want to be part of the conversation when the movie comes out. And then either you couldn't make it to theater and you'll see it later or you want to see it again on streaming. And there's, you know, two movies, two recent movies for us that that's sort of a testament to that. Both Sonic and um, Lost City incredibly, incredibly done, performed very, very well on uh, the service. Um, I think Lost City is, if I'm not mistaken, the uh, most streamed movie on the service. Mm-hmm. And so you take a really good box office result, really good home entertainment result, and a great streaming result. It's kind of like all boats are lifted. And um, we, we, we really like that. I think that's the, the best strategy for us. Do you feel that that you've had to change the programming decisions for, for films theatrically because of what's happening with streaming? Or do you really just, I mean, Lost City was an action picture in a lot of ways, but it was also a romantic comedy. How does, are you pulling back on certain kind of movies? I know it's not your movie, but you know what what happened this weekend, for instance, with Bros was was kind of interesting. I don't think anyone thought it was gonna. Um, you know, people seem to really like it who saw it. It it it. I'm gonna see it. I haven't seen it yet, but I think everyone was a little bit surprised at at the level that it didn't work. Um, 
what do you think about romantic comedies and about comedies playing theatrically? I, I love romantic comedies, always have throughout my career. I think they're, you know, they're tough because they have to be super clever. They have to be well cast. You want to see the, the two stars get together. Yeah, yeah, the chemistry. Um, I love that genre. And, you know, the streamers for a while kind of took it over. Um, I'm not sure they made the best versions of those movies. And I still 100% believe in the theatricality of that. I'm a, I love comedies, too. Um, you know, worked on a lot of them in my career. I think they're risky because they, you, you got to nail them. They have to be, they can't be funny. They have to be hilarious. They have to be like, stop what you're doing. Go see this movie. Go get a babysitter. I got to go to the theater and I got to see that movie. So it's a difficult, it's difficult to pull off. But when you have a great comedy, you, it, it can play forever. So I think comedies are going to make a comeback theatrically. I really do. Um, so we, I, I look at it this way. If you can laugh, if you can cry, if you can be wowed, or if you can be scared in the theater, then I would make that movie. Because that is why people okay. go to have that communal experience. So um, one other kind of genre title, and then I want to get to a bigger macro issue. Um, so family titles, especially animation films. So, you know, when my kids were growing up, my kids were a little older than your kids. Both have three boys, but nevertheless, um, you know, seeing animation movies, seeing Pixar movies was just, they went on the opening weekend. It wasn't really a choice. Um, now often animated movies and family movies aren't even released theatrically, even though they may cost a hundred, 150, even $200 million. Is there a comeback left in that? I know there are certain titles I can hear people watching this saying, yeah, but this movie did that. And, you know, there's always exceptions, but unfortunately there seems to be a little bit more of a trend. And we also see it with companies like Disney who, you know, that's their, one of their core businesses who sometimes are pulling back on releasing family movies theatrically. I was, I don't know if I was surprised that Hocus Pocus 2 didn't come out um, theatrically, but, but it definitely, it startled me because I remember when it came out and it was hugely successful. And even though it's a, a kid's movie, so to speak, it's with Bette Midler and Sarah Jessica Parker and Kathy, you know, it, you, it harkens back to when we all saw it, which most everyone did in a theater. So where do family movies fit in the theatrical um streaming paradigm you think going forward are we still uh adjusting because of of the covid situation or is this the new norm i think there's a little adjusting happening um you know we had huge success with sonic obviously not animated but definitely a family movie um plays general and family but you know we have a movie coming up next year that i'm so excited about uh teenage mutant ninja turtles i'm telling you it is going to be a massive hit it is hysterical Seth Rogen's, you know, he's in charge of, of the movie. It, it's just going to be great. And like, I know that movie's going to be a hit. It's just going to be a hit. And so I completely believe in, in animation. I do think audiences will become more discerning. Um, I think when, when you have an original idea, it is more difficult to get it out into the marketplace. So I could see some people being, uh, you know, not shy about it, but just like careful about, about how they, how they put it out into the world. But I, I think animation, if you hit it right, is, is huge. As obviously, you know, Minions is a big, huge franchise, but, you know, it did pretty well. It did pretty well. And I, it's, I, I, I love animation. So I think it's, it's going to do well. I think there's going to be less of it. Um, you know, it'll be curious to see what happens. Was, is DreamWorks going to continue to make movies under Universal? Fox used to make a ton of animated movies. Are they now stopping because of Disney? So, in that world, we used to have, you know, felt like an animated movie almost, what, every month or every four weeks. I think that's going to slow down. I think you're going to have less uh, animated movies, and I think they'll probably ultimately do better. I think that's the, the next key question, um, and maybe even the last one as we, as we kind of get close to wrapping up. 2019 was the last pre-pandemic year. There were nine global billion-dollar movies. Everyone said... 2022 is going to be the first year that's kind of back to normal so far. And we just made the second one with Jurassic World, which took a while to get to. But we have two. And for the calendar year, maybe hopefully with Wakanda, I suspect we'll have three. I hope we have more, but who knows? Yeah. We've got exhibitors who are just craving as many titles as possible. And yet, and still COVID has something to do with this. 
there aren't as many movies coming out theatrically. It's a, it's a pretty significant difference. Um, where do you think things head? You obviously have a key job at an important studio. Is the volume going to pick up or is this the new norm? I think there'll be bigger movies coming. There might be fewer titles and fewer movies in certain genres, but there's not going to be a slowing down of making of movies. You know, we're increasing our slate as Brian has, has said before. Um, I, like I said, I think every genre, like comedies are going to come back. I think animated movies are going to be back in a big way. Obviously the big action temples, um, horror films have never <laughs> gone out of style. So I, I don't see people making a lot less movies. I think it's, going to do better. I think the, you know, the, the screen X 40 X stuff is going to be huge. I think people really like to have that experience, especially with some of these movies. Um, yeah, I know so Maverick we, was a, ex, extremely successful in screen X 40 X. I think it was, um, you know, IMAX obviously is in a different, in a different league, but, um, but I think screen X 40 X that was uh, Maverick was a little bit of its coming out party. Yeah, it's it's approaching almost $60 million, which is by far the biggest that they've ever had. And that I think is going to grow year after year. So I think as the business grows into like, I want to see movies, big movies, small movies. I just want to go to the movies. I still think we'll continue. Um, it's, a, it's a good time to be in the business. I really do. I really believe it. What, what about 3D? I think 3D is tricky. It's, you know, Avatar is going to bring it back in a big way. That's, that's what we're feeling. Um, he, he's a master at a uh, filmmaker and especially with 3d. So I think you'll have a resurgence of 3d post avatar. Um, definitely internationally stronger than domestically. Um, but it, once again, it's title specific, you know, right. do I really want to go be immersed in that world in 3d like, yeah, for, yeah. for avatar? Absolutely. I mean, everyone's going to And I think other titles coming down too, that you're going to, you're going to want to be in that world. Right. So cool. Well, Thanks. We've hit our, our 30 minutes or so. Um, always fun talking. We get to talk yep. all the time anyway, but it's nice to talk in front of other people. So um, I appreciate you and congratulations again. And to all of those watching, I hope you enjoyed our conversation. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Mark.